be here. I'm going to be preaching twice today, Lord willing. <laughs> Y'all pray for me. <laughs> Amen. If I turn blue and pass out over here, why? Well, uh, just come up and fan me real good, and we'll be all right. Amen. <laughs> brother Robert Gibson will be the first one up here. Fan me good, brother. All right. I want you to turn with me in your Bible to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, please. And verse number 12. If you'd like to stand tonight as we open the pages of the infallible book. Revelation 13. And verse number 12, the divine text says, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Father, bless the reading of your word now. In thy name I pray, my Father, glorify thyself. And amen. You can be seated. The 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, as you know, as you well know, is the chapter that is, uh, introduces us to the rise of the Antichrist. Now, I want you to understand what the word Antichrist means because it's very important. It does not mean so much against Christ. He certainly is that, but that's not so much the meaning of the word. The meaning of the word means to set over in contradistinction in comparison, compar uh, comparative to, to compare the two. He is anti over against him, a different Christ. That's who he is. Another Jesus, another spirit, and another Christ. And so that's what we're concerned ourselves with tonight as we study the Bible and we study the doctrine of the anti-Christ. Now, I'm responsible to God, folks. According to the book of Hebrews, I watch for your souls, that I must give an account. I must give an account, therefore, as my responsibility bears upon me, to keep you abreast of what's going on in the religious world today, especially as it relates to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice something very important tonight. Let me say this as we move along in the message. We are people who believe in Christ. The purpose of this church here on Woodrow Drive is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. My life is to exalt the Son of God. Doctrine is very important. The doctrine, as we call it, Christology, is probably, of all the doctrines in the Bible, the most important. Now, they break them down in a bunch of groups, pneumatology, soteriology, Christology, uh, hamartiology, uh, theology. All of these ologies relate to the, to the discipline of the study of Scripture as it relates to God, man's relationship with God, salvation, the Holy Spirit and all of that. And they're just big words. And the idea is if you hear some young man using all these big words, he's been to some school somewhere because that's usually the idea behind it. But Christology, Christology is the doctrine of your conception or your perception or your, or your, ide, your ideology or your idea of Christ. Who is he? Now, we can differ and churches can differ on liturgy. Liturgy has to do with the way that you come into the church, the way you worship. Some churches are very liturgical. That's uh, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox. All these churches, they're very liturgical. What's that mean? That means that they have a lot of candles. They have a lot of, they have a lot of rituals that they go through, this, that, so forth, and so on. Now, that is a matter of opinion. That's a matter of choice. You can be very liturgical and still be a real believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or you can be non-liturgical, like we are here. We're about as non-liturgical as you get. I mean, some folks come in dressed up. Some folks aren't dressed up. Some folks come in early. Some folks come in late. We do things this way. We do things that way. That is non-liturgical. In other words, there is no set pattern, no set system as to how you come into the house of God. You can still be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and be non-liturgical. All right, I want to put that out there first of all and, make that to, and let that be understood. I'm not up here tonight to bash anybody's form or method of worship. That's not what this is about. What it's about is that it is about the Lord Jesus Christ. That is non-negotiable, as you might say. Is what we believe about the Son of God is all important. God's not so much interested in the color of your robe or the color of your stained glass in your window or whatever you might, uh, accoutrements that you might have in your buildings or the way you conduct your ministries and all of that. 
That's not what he's so much interested in as he is in what you believe about the Lord Jesus Christ. That is all important because that will determine your relationship with God the Father. The Bible said that he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So the Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only Savior of mankind. Neither is there salvation in any other, nor the name given under heaven, whereby we must be saved. It takes the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to establish a blood covenant between God and man, not the blood of bulls and goats. There is a clear distinction, line of demarcation between Old Testament sacrifices and as John the Baptist called him, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The Lord Jesus Christ therefore becomes to us the great high priest seated at the right hand of the Father who intercedes for us and makes it possible for us to approach Almighty God. So the Lord Jesus Christ is everything to the Christian, not something or part of his worship or part of his belief. What you believe about the Son of God is absolutely important. Now today we have what's called the emerging church movement or the emergent church. It's a conglomeration, a mishmash, a mixing up of a lot of different types of theologies, takes on the Bible, and what have you. The main thing that pulls these people together or identifies them is not their doctrine. It's not what they believe about the Lord Jesus Christ. It is, has nothing to do with a personal relationship by the new birth uh, through Christ with God. It has nothing to do with that. What they are based upon is a feeling and an experience, especially a spiritual experience. That's what they are all about. You say, well, no, preacher, I'll watch out for churches like that. No, you won't. They're next door. Your family members go to them. They're all over the place to varying degrees, one degree or another. Some are full-blown emergent churches. Some embrace some of the doctrines of the emergent church. But it has infiltrated most of what's called American Christianity today. It has infiltrated most of what's called American Christianity today. So you've got to be on guard. You've got to be very careful. When you read Revelation 13, you say to yourself, how could it be that people could worship something on this earth? But once you redefine spiritual truths, once you cast them in an entirely different light that the scripture cast them in, you can do anything. And that's exactly what these people are doing. And it's our responsibility and mine as a pastor to warn you about what's coming down the road and what's here now and the preparation for a one world religion that worships the beast, the Antichrist, by virtue of the false prophet. So I want to give you some quotes, first of all, as to what these people say. One said, the other thread of just criticism addresses the suggestion implicit in the cross that Jesus' sacrifice was to appease an angry God. Penal substitution was the name of this vile doctrine. Now let me interpret that for you. This man just said that if you believe that an angry God punished the Lord Jesus Christ for your sins and that he died a vicarious death on the cross as the Lamb of God bearing in his body your sin, that's a vile doctrine to these people. Let that settle in. The Bible says in the Old Testament that God is angry with the wicked every day. But when you carry that over into the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 5, it says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. That angry God in the Old Testament was in the Lord Jesus Christ reconciling himself to mankind. Now the plea goes out, be ye reconciled to God. So the idea that that's a vile doctrine strikes at the very heart of our faith. The Bible said in Isaiah chapter number 53 that God hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Bible says in 1 Peter that he bore in his body our sins. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. So what we have here is in the very face of God in his teeth 
a declaration by these people that the great truths of atonement and reconciliation are vile, according to these people. Is that a brother in Christ? Are these brothers and sisters in Christ? Do these people know our Lord Jesus Christ? No, they don't know him. They can say Jesus until they turn pink. They can call him the Lord of glory all they want to. They do not know the God of the Bible. They preach another Jesus. And it's important tonight to understand that. They are not your brother and sister. They are enemies of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If someone in your family is being seduced into this heresy, then you need to deal with them and talk to them about it because it is a godless, Hinduistic, Americanized, uh, synthesized, fabricated religion. It is not pure Hinduism at all. They take the elements of Hinduism they like and recreate them in Western thought. And that's exactly what's going on. Another quote, I see the world through the images of Christianity, which teaches me that I encounter God in everyone I meet, regardless of what they believe. Now you're beginning to understand what's going on because it's all relativism. It's all based upon that. What happens is that you take the educational system under Dewey about 40, 50 years ago when he became the father of modern education. You go into the classroom. You first of all destroy their faith in the Bible by giving them a constant dose of evolution. You give them that constant dose of evolution. Once you've destroyed their faith in the Bible, you build it back up in something else. And what you've done is build it up in man. That's called humanism. So their faith now is in man and not in God. But once you build your faith in man, men are imperfect beings. All men are imperfect beings. So what kind of faith do you have? You have a relativistic faith because your belief, your belief now is in mankind and man's ability to overcome his problems and all of that, and you know it's flawed. So what happens is, well, if it feels good for me, I do it. If it feels good for you, do it. And on and on and on and on it goes and it feeds itself. And the first thing you know, you have a whole generation of people today, and we have them today, that are as ignorant of the Bible as they can be, and they go to church every Sunday. And if Satan can keep you ignorant of the doctrines of the Bible, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Paul said, you have fully known my doctrine. Paul said, I did not consult with flesh and blood, but God took me immediately into Arabia, and it was there that he revealed the great truths of the revelation of the Godhood of Christ, who is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, the fullness of the Godhead manifest bodily in the Son of God. He revealed the mystery of the Bride of Christ, which is the Church of God. He revealed the mystery of the Gentiles, of the body of Christ, the, the Christ in you, the hope of glory. He revealed the mystery of the rapture of the church to me. He revealed these mysteries to me. Paul said, I, he revealed all that to me. And yet these people today, in the face of that, throw out the big, biggest majority of the New Testament. Why do they throw it out? Because it does not match their experience. These churches today are completely experience oriented. It's all about an experience. It's about a feeling. It's about a spirit. It's about a tingling sensation. It's about the Kundalini Yoga. As some of them say, they can feel a serpent as it moves itself coming up their spine and it comes up to the top of their head and they have this, this static feeling. They can feel the universe. They have, this, they have this ultra consciousness that comes upon them. It's like the old psychedelic drugs like LSD and them they used to take that puts them in this altered state of consciousness. They get this through this spiritual experience of yoga, kundalini yoga. And it is an experience that is unforgettable. Oh, what a wonderful thing when it first happens. But have you ever read what continues to happen? Have you read about those that are driven completely insane? Have you read about the situation where they are literally, a, they literally see stuff crawling on the walls, crawling on their skin, and they commit suicide? Every amount imaginable thing is connected with demonic possession and that's what happens when you get off into kundalini yoga and the actual practice of yoga itself is the first step toward kundalini yoga the word kundalini means the coiled serpent where did that come from preacher it came from hinduism it's pure hinduism does christ need buddha does christ need hindu does the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ need to appeal to a pagan, dark world like that? 
Are there truths in that that you need to learn on top of the word of the living God? No, but that's what's being peddled today as Christianity. Here's another statement of the relativism. Is Christianity true? Sit down here next to me in this little restaurant, ask me if Christianity, or your version of it, the Pope, what have you, is orthodox, meaning true. Here's my honest answer, a little, but not yet. Assuming by Christianity you mean the Christian understanding of the world and God, Christian opinions on soul, text, culture, I'd have to say that we probably have a couple of things right, but a lot of things wrong, and even more sprints before it's unseen and unimagined. What's that mean? That means that you have no absolute truths. That's what it means. Once you have an absolute truth, you have a standard to live by. And an absolute truth is something that judges you. You don't judge it. As long as you can keep it relativistic. You know what I mean by that? Relativistic means you have your truth, I've got my truth. If that's good for you, good. This is good for me. If that's what you want to do, you do that, I'm going to do what I do. Do you think that is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Listen to this. Buddhist, Hindu, Jewish disciples don't have to adhere to Christianity. I must add, though, that I don't believe making disciples must equal making adherence to the Christian religion. It may be advisable in many, not all circumstances, to help people become followers of Jesus and remain within their Buddhist, Hindu, or Jewish context. Did you hear that? Do you, do you hear this? This will be hard, you say, and I agree, but frankly, it's not at all easy to be a follower of Jesus in many Christian religious contexts either. And he introduces a term here you hear all the time. You hear this today constantly, follower of Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. I follow Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, now the Bible uses that terminology, and that's not so much a bad term. But the problem is there's a stronger term than being a follower of Jesus. There's a term that, had, that, bear, that carries a profound meaning. You see, you can be a follower of Jesus and be one of the worst fornicators that ever walked the face of the earth because you can follow whatever you choose to follow in Jesus. A follower of Jesus can follow his teachings, but he can pick and choose what he follows. A follower of Jesus is someone who says, well, I like what Jesus said about this, but I'm not so hot about what he said about that. That's your relativism again. It's the cafeteria religion. You go through the line, you pick and choose what you like. But my friend, a greater term, a much more powerful term is the one that the Lord used in John 3 when he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. It is the new birth. It is, that, is not, that is not negotiable. You must be born again. You must be born again. And the new birth is not something that you can do. The new birth is what God does to you. He does it in you with the power of the Holy Spirit of God. The new birth is when you are transformed, literally changed, from a natural man to a spiritual man, from a lost man to a saved man, to a man who has no hope, to a man who is in Christ, in the blessed hope of our glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The new birth changes you. You can babble on about the new birth, talk about it, praise it, and, and, you know, and preach about it and all of that, and still not be born again. The new birth is when you have received into your soul the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, accepted him. And by doing that act of faith, accepting him, a miraculous change takes place inside you. That change changes you from a natural child of hell to a son of the living God. And that can't be, that can't be substituted. There's no, there's no substitution for it. These people say nothing about the new birth. They're all followers of Jesus. Well, there's another Jesus. There's another spirit. There's another gospel. So if you're following Jesus, which Jesus are you following? That won't get it with me. You better be more than a follower of Jesus. That won't cut it. That won't cut it. There better be more to you than a follower of Jesus. Because when you say, I've been born again, then you put yourself under the light. When you say, I have experienced the new birth in Christ, then there is a witness of the spirit of the living God between me and you. And once that takes place, that cannot be counterfeited. That's the safeguard he's given us. Us, we believers in our, in our Lord Jesus Christ, that we love him and bless him and praise his holy, sweet, blessed name. I don't compare him to Buddha. I don't need Buddha. I don't compare him to Hindu religion. I don't need the Hindu or the Muslim. I don't need anything they got. I got everything I need in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's all to me in everything that I could possibly need. And you don't have to be around someone long to know that they love Jesus, that they have the sweet Holy Spirit in them, 
Because the Holy Spirit in them will not talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will talk about Christ. And when you get around somebody and you start exalting the Lord Jesus, talking about his godhood, he's God in flesh, that he's the coming King of kings and Lord of lords, neither is there salvation in any other, and what he did for me and he raised me from the dunghill, how he came into my heart and he changed my life. If a man doesn't know him, he'll start to get uncomfortable. He may flip back with some religious cliches. He may counter with some, some uh, churchianity and, and churchianity doctrinal statements and so forth. But if he doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're putting him to the acid test and he will yield in time Amen. you'll get very uncomfortable Amen. very uncomfortable Amen. do you know Jesus Amen. I'm not asking you who you're following do you know Jesus Amen. he that hath the son hath life and he that hath not the son hath not life but the wrath of God abideth on him another quote is the church has been preoccupied with the question what happens to your soul after you die that's a good question one time in my life, I went through the valley of the shadow of death. And do you know what I was thinking about? My soul. Amen. Amen. If you've never been to the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. But if you've ever been there, that's what you're going to be thinking about, is your soul. As if the reason for Jesus coming can be summed up, Jesus is trying to help get you more souls into heaven as opposed to hell after they die. He says, I just think a fair reading of the Gospels blows that out of the water. I don't think that the entire message and life of Jesus can be boiled down to that bottom line. There we go again. Oh, it can't? Well, here's what he said. What should it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his? Thou fool, this night thy shall be required of thee. You don't think the Lord Jesus Christ was concerned about the souls of men? And here this man has the audacity to say that that's not really what his ministry was about. Do you know why he says that? He says that because there are those countless multitude out, that multitude out there that, that, that have this, this foggy idea of some kind of a savior or a God, but they really don't know him. So, but as long as they're sincere in what they're doing, everything's okay. That's the idea. That's why that type of interpretation the emergent church doesn't have a position on absolute truth. I'm sure it doesn't. Or on anything for that matter. <laughs> Do you show up at a dinner party with your neighbors and ask, what's this, dinner's, what's this dinner party's position on absolute truth? No, you don't. Because it's a nonsensical question. Oh, it's not? Oh, it is? I think absolute truth is very important. Because you are absolutely going to an absolute place when you die. And it's not going to be, uh, it's, not, it's not relative. It's going to be absolute. When you get ready to die, folks, you're going one of two places. Do you know the greatest deception that Satan has given mankind? I'm going to tell you what it is. It's that spirit of invincibility that you've got in your breast right now tonight. You, you think about death in an intellectual manner. Oh, I know I'm going to die someday but way off down through there. And I'll know all about it when the time comes and blah, blah, blah. You don't know it in an experiential manner. In plain words, you don't really, 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 really believe deep, deep down in your soul this could be the last day on planet Earth for you. Amen. Amen. That tonight before midnight, you'll draw your last breath. There's just something about it that gives me a big advantage over you because I live with that moment by moment. I've got a big advantage. I don't live for tomorrow, it's for right now. Because I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow morning, but I know where I'll be if I'm not here tomorrow morning. I got a big advantage over you. Your, your, your concept of death is intellectual. You assent to a fact, but it doesn't affect the way you live. That's why Christians, most Christians in America, live this laid-back, lackadaisical, uh, don't-care, cavalier attitude. Well, I'm once saved, always saved, and, you know, I'll be okay when it, when it happens. I'm not worried about it, and blah, 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 blah. That's an intellectual assent to a fact, but that never affects the way you live. Are you in that category tonight? I hope not, but you may be. You may be. You may be, you may be, this may be the last day on planet 
earth for you and for me. It may be. And before I lay my head on my bed tonight, I will be on my knees, bless the name, and I will make certain that there is nothing between me and God. I'll make certain of that by the grace of God because I can't do anything about it, but I will plead that blood covenant and that mercy that I know is mine, and I will plead for him to cleanse me in the precious blood of Christ. And that's the, what I'm counting in. That's what I'm counting in. That's what I'm counting. That's what I'm trusting in. I'm trusting in God's goodness and his mercy and his graciousness that he cannot lie. I'm trusting in the fact that if I will confess and plead that blood and ask him to wash my sins away, sins that I don't even, not even conscious of, but to cleanse me in the precious blood of Christ and trust my life and my soul into his hands, I fully believe tonight that being a gracious, merciful God, he'll cleanse me and I'll be ready. Amen. Amen. My goal is to destroy Christianity, he says, as a world religion, be a recatalyst for the movement of Jesus Christ. Author of a new book said in a telephone interview, some people are upset with me because it sounds like I'm anti-Christian. I think they might be right. He wants to reshape, rethink, repackage the movement of Jesus Christ. Have you ever lived in a more arrogant generation than this one? Really? Really? Folks, do you think the generation that just went before us was a bunch of dumb heads? Let me tell you something. Most of the books I read were written in the 16 and 1700s. If I have a hundred books, I might have one or two written a contemporary author. And I'm not saying all contemporary authors are bad. One or two may be. The vast majority, and I'm talking about, I'm talking about theology, doctrine, stuff like that. The vast majority of what I read is written in the 1600s and the 1700s and the 1800s. Do you know why? They were smart men. Very, very smart men. I hear the babble that comes out from behind the pulpits today. This, this regurgitated babble that comes out to the people by these preachers. And all in the world it is is just a bunch of worm, warmed over, reshaped and recast uh, religious platitudes it pre prepared, prepared, presented in a positive fashion to make you feel good about yourself. That's all it is. That's all it is. Yet this arrogant crowd thinks they are so smart that they can repackage the Lord Jesus Christ and present him to this generation. Boy, there's something. Boy, did not God, did not God pick them? You ought to get a book written by Heinrich Meyer or Dingle. Uh, what's his first? I can't. These are both German. One lived in the 1700s, the other lived in the early 1800s. You ought to get their commentaries and read what these men, Lightfoot is another one, read what these men have to say about the scriptures and let them take you into the Bible and read the Word of God. And you know what you'll say to yourself? Man. I never had my idea in my life that the Bible had that much to say, that it was that deep, that it was that powerful. Because most of the TV slop you get is, is positive confession, feel good about self, prosperity, money, 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 money. Don't you get sick of it? That's all you get. And this bunch has the arrogance. I mean the arrogance to say, we're going to change it all. And we're going to repackage Jesus Christ to the whole world. No, I'm going to tell you what you're doing. You are a tool in the hand of Satan.
an ignoramus that doesn't have enough sense to come in out of the cold that he's using to redefine Christianity and prepare this whole world for the Antichrist. When he shows up, you will be one of his mouthpieces and champions to get the job done because you are as ignorant of who the Lord Jesus Christ is than any dog barking on the street corner. You don't have a clue who you're talking about. Now that's the truth. That's the truth. And your arrogance has blinded you to the truth. Who's the Son of God? He's the only name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. Is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what am I going to do? I'm going to preach Christ and Him crucified. And I'm not going to try to change the meaning of who He is and redefine our faith. I'm not about to do that. It takes an ignorant fool to get up and think he is so smart that he can change everything just because he lives in a generation that's arrogant like that. Everything changes. Throw out everything that's old. All the old music, just throw it out. All the old stuff, throw it away. It's useless. But these books right here have songs in them that have power. They've got power. There's power in there. And I'm not about to throw out something that's got power like that. Written by men and women who love the Lord. And they love the Lord that I know. The Lord of the Bible. Well, let me read this for you. Some of the values of the emerging church are an emphasis on emotions, global outlook, a rise in the use of arts, and a rise in mysticism and spirituality. There you go. There you go. They have a global perspective. The terminology is paradigm shift. That means to change completely from the old into the new. They have what's called contemplative spirituality. Here's a definition of it. A belief system that uses ancient mystical practices to induce altered states of consciousness and is often wrapped in Christian terminology, the premise of a contemplated spirituality is pantheistic. That means God is all. And panentheistic, God is in all. That is the spirituality of the vast majority of the mainline Protestant churches and the emergent church movement in America and in the world. They are as deeply rooted in the occult as you could possibly be. They quote mantras. A mantra is something that you quote over and over and over again. The popularity of Buddhist practice among Christians has grown substantially during the last two decades. So it has. It has grown enormously in the last two decades. And it's growing by leaps and by bounds. The purpose of the message tonight is to warn you. It's to warn you. It's to tell you that if some family member, you have a brother or sister, some, some family member that goes to a church and they start telling you about this great experience they're having, about this teacher that's been brought in, about this new way of seeing things, and they want to recruit you. That's the point. They want to recruit you into this new movement. Beware. 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 Be warned tonight. It is pure poison. It is pure poison. It will affect you in ways that you never imagine. I'm going to say some things tonight. Be very careful the way I say them. Come to a close. Because I see what's headed. I see what's coming. I, I, see, what's, I see what's coming down the pipe. Kundalini arousal. This kundalini spirit. This coiled serpent spirit. Now, first of all, I'd ask you a question tonight, dear Christian friend. Is there one place in the Word of God where a serpent is ever cast in a good light? Let the Bible be the judge. One time. One time. The only time a serpent is used to affect something that was, uh, that's, that, that's good is in the book of Numbers when the brazen serpent was lifted upon the pole. All right? But that is a picture of a curse. Because the Lord Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, 
Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That was a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore in the Bible a serpent is cast in a negative light. So why would a Christian want to have anything to do with a serpent? Especially as it relates to his faith. I'm not talking about having a pet uh, uh, boa constrictor or anaconda in the house. You know, you may be here today and you may not be here tomorrow. <laughs> we find the snake, we'll find you. Amen. They just killed one in Florida, by the way, a, uh, a, uh, a uh, python, a python, well, the Burmese python. They killed a Burmese python in Florida, 18 feet, 8 inches long. The record was 17 feet, 7 inches up until just two or three weeks ago. They had laid the thing out on. They had about four or five men laying end to end. And there that thing lay as a female and had eggs in it. 18 feet, 8 inches long. Now you wouldn't want to meet up with that thing on a dark, uh, dark night, would you? Serpents are in a bad, cast in a bad light in the Word of God. Bad light. Here's some of the symptoms of kundalini arousal. Burning heat or ice cold currents moving up the spine. In most cases, reaching the head. Sometimes a feeling of air bubbles or snake movement up through the body up to the head. Sensitivity to sound, light, smell, and the proximity of other people. The reason for the sensitivity to the proximity of other people is because of the soul and the power of the soul. You get around a dead body, you feel no more than this. Standing next to this piece of wood, there's nothing in here. You get around a living human being, and the closer you draw to a living human being, you start feeling it. How many know what I'm talking about? You're feeling the soul. Uh, terminology that relates to sexual experiences prevail in this thing. It has become very sexual, sexual in nature. And this is where the power lies in it, because this is a generation that's thrown out all the mores, all of the fears, all of the conduct. This thing is very, very, very sexual in its orientation. Yeah. Mystic religious experiences, revelation, or cosmic glimpses. Sure. Parapsychological abilities, light phenomena in or outside the body, and persistent anxiety or anxiety attacks due to the lack of understanding of what's going on, insomnia, manic high spirits, or deep depression, energy loss, impaired concentration and memory, total isolation due to inability to communicate, inner experiences out, and on and on and on and on and on the list goes. All you have to do is get some of the classic commentaries, uh, research material written by men who uh, lived 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago in foreign land. Randy Pike is outstanding. Brother Pike has enormous experience in this. And let them tell you about demon experiences and you'll, you'll begin to you'll be amazed at how this kundalini yoga, the experiences in kundalini yoga run parallel with the demon experiences of men like Randy Pike on the mission field, ministering, watching the power of demons as they work in human beings. The man knows what he's talking about, folks. And compare that with what's going on today in this, in this kundalini yoga movement in the churches, and you'll see the source of it. What's the source of it? The source of it is Satan. It's demonic. Kundalini yoga is demonic possession. That's all it is, pure and simple, pure and plain as it can be. If you want to open yourself up for demonic possession, sit down in the lotus position, start quoting some mantra over and over and over again in your head, empty yourself <clears throat> of the discerning spirit of the Holy Ghost, and of course you can't if you're really born again, but empty your mind of everything and open yourself up for the spirit that comes to you and you'll get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until the first thing you know, you are completely demon possessed. And then get ready because your life will become a living hell and you'll not be able to deal with it. The only one that can deal with demon possession is the one who came into this world and made a show of them openly. The Lord Jesus Christ. Father, in thy name we pray. I pray what I've said tonight has been a help. Lord, I don't know. I'm just a man. I have no idea if there's anybody in this house tonight who's near this or this, is, this, is, this has been they've, been, they've been solicited into it. I don't know. But God help them tonight to take the truth of what I've said, to be a warning, to be armed to have the knowledge to arm them against this. 
to be prepared for the enemy when he comes. Those who watched this over the internet, if they saw it tonight, I pray that they'd take heart because you told us plainly in your word what to expect. You said in the last days perilous times should come. And the first thing you said about those perilous times, that men should be lovers of their own selves. And Lord, I've heard self-love preach for the last 30 years by some of the biggest evangelists in this country in spite of what you said in the book of Second Timothy in the face of the scripture when you said plainly, lovers of their own selves. God, we pray. Glorify yourself tonight. In Jesus' blessed, sweet, holy name I pray. Amen. All right. Well, let's stand up tonight. Page 124 in your All-American. Appreciate you listening to me tonight. Thank you. God bless you.